so it looks like it's going. So I have to tell you because I'm recording it. I'm, you're being recorded, so you know, don't admit to killing anybody right now. Like <laughs> <laughs> My is just now going to bed, so. Uh, mine are up for another three hours. Yeah, well, my, my oldest is up. She'll be up in her room. They're, they're watching TV, so they haven't quite gone to bed yet, but they're just... Huh? Yeah, but Ruby's probably going to wake upstairs. <laughs> well, I tried to get this little setup here. I got... Uh, I figured since I was talking to you, I'd have to get some sort of IPA. Oh, all right. What's all, this, what's all this weirdness? What's that? My my thing just did something weird because I put this in front of it. Yeah, oh. I got a uh, Voodoo Ranger Juicy Haze. Nice. Ever tried that one? I have. I'm not a big fan of the Juicy Haze. Yeah. Um, or the Haze in general, I should say. Um, I like the actual Voodoo Ranger, just regular. Yeah, get that. I got a I got a variety pack. So I just had that's what this is the regular one. Nice. I've got here and and. To go along with the uh, your character in the book, I had this mug, this uh, glass I had in the freezer. Sweet. It's just a generic. It's a generic mug, but it's I don't know what it is. Kansas, something about my fair lady, Kansas City. I don't know something we picked up at a Goodwill or something. But right. I put it in the freezer this afternoon when I picked up my beer and I said I'm gonna open up one, and put it in this nice cold. I had a friend that used to do that. They used to always have glasses in the in the freezer. I have never done it, but. All right, well, you know, if you're going to do that. Uh-oh. Oh, no, we're, we're gonna, at the bar. We're going to come over here to the Everson beer fridge. I like it. There we go. And you'll see <laughs> that it's real, man. They're always got to keep your frosty glasses right here. So, uh, nice. We'll do, we'll do a revolution. Because it's Chicago here. Oh, yeah. Uh, you got to have your Revolution IPA, anti-hero. Nice. No, I've never tried that. Uh, that's awesome. That's what I uh, cut my teeth on IPAs. I never used to like IPAs, and then I tried this. Now that's all I drink. The first IPA I ever had was in, we were in New Orleans, which is funny. That ties back to your book. The new book, which is Voodoo Heart for anyone. I mean, I don't know how I'm going to edit this in here, but we'll fix it up somehow. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking we'd jump into beer later, but beer early is good for me too, I guess. So well, You're going to start uh, drinking. I, I need something with me. Right. Yeah, I had a, uh, a Giacomo. I think it was called Giacomo IPA. Yeah. Um, who the hell was it? A, a Beta? Yeah. It's probably a Beta, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't in beta. And it was just because I was staying, I work at a Hampton Inn, so I was staying at a Hampton Inn down there, and they had a bar there. So I went in and I just asked for something local, and that's what the big local beer was that summer, or whatever. And I fell in love with them. I, I, I'd never tried an IPA before. It was the first one. My wife tried it. I made her try it. She hated it. So it tasted like, what, flowers? Sushi. Sushi? She thought it tasted like sushi. <laughs> yeah, it does never taste had Sushi. I don't think I want to. I like sushi, but I don't want to drink it. Right, right. No, I saw when I was, it's always a, there's always a beer up here that's some sort of lobster beer. I always see it in the store. I don't know who makes it, but it's, I've never, I don't like lobster and I don't want to ruin my love of beer with putting lobster of any sort in there. I can't even imagine how bad it is, but they sell it. No thanks. So I'm like, yeah, no thanks. So, Let's see. Uh, I've got your website pulled up right here, right now. I'm just checking it out. And I, do you do this website yourself, or do yeah. you have someone doing this? Uh, you do. I've always done. Yeah, I've always done you're, my own website. You're, you're the master of the dark arts, right? <laughs> no, you know what? When I started doing websites, it was back in the days of AOL, when you could upload H raw HTML files to a little directory that they mm -hmm. gave you. I don't remember how much space you had. But, you know, you could upload a bunch of HTML files and then your directory was like AOL.com slash mine, I think was JJENet. And you could send people there and there was your website. And so, like, I've built websites since the early 90s. Since it started. 
Yeah. And I remember I Angel. I think Angel my, Fire was the first one. Ah, yeah, that was in Geo Cities and uh, yeah, all those yeah. little. Yep. Yeah. But no, yeah, back uh, in... this current website has been up like two, three years, but the one before it, I had for like 10 years and I loved the design of it so much. I had worked mm -hmm. with somebody who did a cool graphic. It was like using the cover from my Needles and Sins book and like integrating it into the nav and everything. And so right. she did a real job with it. And so I carved it up. I used that site for 10 years. <laughs> and finally, I was just like, okay, I actually manage like websites and building and whatnot at work. I'm like, this is embarrassing because this oh, site yeah. looks old you really need to update your site <laughs> so i redid it and finally went wordpress but yeah it looks great i've got it pulled up behind me right now it, it look i'm just in awe like i i get so frustrated like i use wordpress and mine's real simple mine still looks as generic as any of the the early angel fire or anything else i built you know maybe a little bit better the access and the posting stuff's a lot easier but this looks this looks great. I mean, like you said, though, you do this for a living. It's part, partly what it's part I, of you yeah, do. I started. Yeah, yeah, I started out in publications and did magazine work and everything else. And when the when they wanted to do a website, I had already done a little AOL stuff because I had a music column for a newspaper, mm -hmm. and the newspaper back then didn't have a website yet. And I was like, well, I'm writing all these columns, and I want like there to be a library of them for me, if for no one else. And so that's why I started my website originally was just to archive my music columns. Right. Uh, and so when my day job decided that they wanted to have a website, I was on the team that helped build it. And so I've sort of been involved ever since. I've done a lot of other different things there, but. Cool, very cool. And so back, so you did a music column and, and were you around Chicago the whole time? Have you always lived around that area? I have. Um, uh, you know, I've I've always wanted to get out to San Francisco or Santa Fe or Austin. Or <laughs> I love right. all these other places, and I've I've actually been lucky enough to travel for work a lot, so I've spent a lot of time in those places. But no, I I seem to always have been centered right here in Chicago, where it's cold half the year, and right now <laughs> I know all about I, that. I'm up here. I am, I guess, but. So with the with the music column, did you ever interact with bands and stuff coming through town, or was oh, it just yeah. mostly reviews and stuff? No, I. Uh, so I mean, my background was I did a lot of feature writing and music writing and stuff when I was in college, and so when I was a newspaper reporter right, right out of college for a couple, for it was like a chain of suburban newspapers all around the south side of Chicago called the Star, um, and I said to them after I was there a few months. So, uh, and they said well you still have to cover the payless park and i was like well all right but uh <laughs> so i started doing this weekly column and i got you know and i'd done it at college so i knew how to get on mailing lists and everything else and so pretty soon yeah i was getting you know all the albums and all these opportunities to interview bands and go see shows nice. and after a couple nice. of years of that um i actually got the opportunity to go be an editor uh, at a local music magazine called an Illinois Entertainer. Um, an Illinois Entertainer, it's kind of like for, for anyone in San Francisco, there's BAM, um, there's, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones, there's, you know, every city has like a free music magazine, well, Illinois Entertainer is Chicago's. Um, and I was there for four years uh, until I decided I really needed to be able to pay the mortgage. Um, but during that point, and then I kept the music column at the newspaper all through that. So I actually wrote a weekly music column for 20 years. Um, it was it was honestly Covenant that stopped me from being a music writer uh, because that was right around 20 years of doing it every single week, which trust me, it does become a grind, even though it's like the most wonderful thing in the world. Oh, yeah. It becomes a grind. Um, you know, the wall behind me. That's that's the wall of music, okay? So that's that's why all that's there is because that's all music critic stuff. I got tons and tons and tons of stuff. Up up towards the ceiling, I have all sorts of like weird little tchotchke things that I got from various record labels. I've got like 4,000 CDs down here and that's, you know, probably a tenth of what I got while I was a critic, but um, and, 
point was I got to do all these interviews and meet all these bands and, and it was great. But then my fiction writing actually started taking off. Covenant came yeah. out and at that point the newspaper I was with merged with another one and they sacked all their freelancers. So at that point I was like, well, I actually was freelancing all occasionally for other places too. So I had a, my column ran in Cincinnati briefly. Um, and I was like, well, I could go that route and see if I can get it, you know, back in some other cities or do some stuff like that. Or I can focus on promoting this new novel career, which is just starting out with a mass market press. And that's, you know, you know what I decided. <laughs> right, right, right. And so I'm trying to remember because I had never like the first book I read from you was the 13th, which is still probably my favorite. I don't know if it's just because it was my introduction or what. Um, I mean, it's got like that, the satanic cult thing going on there as well, which is always fascinating for me. But I read Covenant. Yep. I've got, oh, look, oh, wait, wait. I, there you yeah. go. My original edition that came through in the uh, book club. Nice. And the one that followed. Yep. Oh, no. uh, I never read Covenant until last year, I think, when we when I was doing that uh, leisure books, the leisure time thing where uh, I think it was. Yeah, it was last year, I think, where I started trying to read through some of the ones I hadn't read or some of that I wanted to reread. And of yours, I had, you know, obviously picking up you go to the Goodwill or whatever. You find all these old leisure books hanging around. And uh, so I grabbed Covenant and that was the first time I, I ever read that one. So I, it was uh Probably, I don't know, fifth, sixth, seventh book I've read of yours was your first book. Oh, wow. And I don't remember, did, was it, I know Delirium has a has a play in this somewhere. Did you publish this with them first or with, with Leisure Books first? No, it was a Delirium original. Um, and that was, <laughs> it's funny. I My very first book um, was Cage of Bones which I also brought for show and tell. Yay. Um, I Kate don't have a copy of that. was uh, back when Delirium was first starting out, they were originally a magazine and I had a couple of pieces published in the magazine. And then Shane Staley decided he wanted to do books. And so I pitched him on doing a, a short fiction collection. It was going to be like a little chat book or something. Mm -hmm. And by the time it came out, it was a hardcover, you know, 250 or 500 copy, I forget, you know, limited signed edition thing. I was like, wow, this is really cool. I mean, I'd been writing short stories through the 90s and being in all these little magazines and anthologies, yeah. but I, I was going to have a hardcover book. So that came out. That was really cool. That's when I went to my first world horror, which was back in Denver in 2000 to start promoting it. Um, and that's kind of when I really started making the rounds to conventions and, and that was the same year that I finished the first draft of Covenant. And so Covenant was one of those stories of, I have rejection letters from every agent, and every publisher in the country that made the rounds for two, three years. And at one point I sat down and completely rewrote it. Um, I went through and it, it grew like 20,000 words. I re, you know, edited every single line. Yeah. Um, and sent it out again and still wasn't getting anywhere. And I had pitched the book um, a couple of times to Don at Leisure during World mm -hmm. Horror Conventions, which I'd started to go to. And he was always like receptive to it. He liked the idea, but he, you know, it was always, well, I have 24 slots for horror and there's nothing open right now. I mean, it was basically, you know, that's what it was. They did two horror titles a month. And so there were 24 authors in the mix, basically, maybe a few more if people didn't do Actually, probably a few less because some people were doing twice a year, right? Right. So I don't, I don't know how many the actual list was, but you know, it was, it was a tough job to get into leisure, but it's where you wanted to be because they were in all the bookstores and it came out constantly, and you know, you got distribution. And so mm -hmm. I kept pitching to him every year. I rewrote the book during that time, and still wasn't getting anywhere. So finally, for me, it was like, all right, well, I know Shane will publish it. But I also know if it comes out in a little 250 copy hardcover, it's dead because most mass market publishers would not pick up anything that had been previously published. And so my whole goal was to make that book and get it to bookstores. And so when I gave it to Delirium, it was like defeat, which is yeah. funny because 
at the end of the day, I got a beautiful hardcover limited out of it. It won the the Bram Stoker Award the next year, and then they also at that point I started I started writing the sequel not not because I thought it needed a sequel, but I just had this other idea for a story. Actually, no, back back up a second. I started <laughs> writing the sequel before I gave it to to Delirium. That's that's why it was not a necessary sequel in a sense that someone said go write a sequel to it. I couldn't sell the first book, and I had a, a, another story <laughs> about the reporter that I wanted to tell, and so I tried yeah. to write Sacrifice as a standalone book before I'd ever sold the first one, and ultimately, they both came out on Delirium. Um, I didn't. I don't think I finished writing that one until Covenant came out, but started it ahead of time. Anyway, so both of them were out. It was 2007, and I went to Toronto World Horror um, and pitched to Don again, and I said, look, um, I think Delirium at that point was going to do mat, uh, trade paperbacks. Um, so if there was ever a chance, and I knew it by that point that Leisure had picked up some Delirium titles and redone them, but if they came out in paperback, there was no way that was going to happen. So I said, you know, should I go with Delirium? Should you know, is there a chance that I'm going to go with you? Um, and a few hours later, uh, he called me over from, we were in the mass market, or the mass autograph signing at Toronto World Horror, where like all these people stream in and out of the aisles and get all their books signed and whatnot. And Don came in and said, hey, can I talk to you a minute? And I was like, okay, Don Dory, no please talk to me. Uh, we go out into the hallway and he made me a two-book offer for Covenant and Sacrifice. He had, he had uh, found a place on the list. So that was a really, really long story to get to how Covenant happened. But yeah, it was a long, long time in coming. The book was originally finished in 2000, sold to Leisure ultimately in 2007, came out in 2008. Well, that's the kind of thing I talk to, and I'm sure you do too, a lot of aspiring writers who are just getting started or reviewing and kind of working on something with the intent of hopefully putting something out. And, you know, that's kind of why I'm doing this show that I'm trying, hopefully, putting together on a regular basis is to share stories like this, too. I mean, that's that's like, it doesn't happen overnight. It really usually doesn't. I mean, once in a blue moon, it does, but this, this, is, a, this is a regular story right here because, like, I'm listening to you talking about how you talked to Don about it, showed it to him. He, you know, just didn't have room or whatever. I think with Blood and Rain, I did the same thing. Like, I, I remember showing it to him I don't know if I, I pitched it a couple of times. I pitched it to him in a few different uh, places, like at the World Horror Cons, at those pitch sessions. And it got a lot of, like, people, I, uh, somehow, and I don't know how, because I suck at pitching. I just ramble on and on. And uh, somehow they were still like, well, we'll look at it. We like to look at it. And so I always get that. And Don, Don uh, read it and said, uh, I, I'm going to pass on this, but send me whatever you write next. So that, that gave me like the, the, whoa, he actually he saw something in there that he liked. Yeah. Um, so I wrote a couple, I wrote a couple of other things, novellas, cause Sam Hain at the time was doing novellas. So <laughs> I started that way after I sold him a couple of those, I said, Hey, I've reworked that. Remember that werewolf book? I rewrote it. I think you'd really like it. And by that time, you know, he liked my stuff and he was like, well, uh, yeah, I'll take another look at it if you've reworked it. And at that point, when I told him that, I had not <laughs> reworked it at all. I had I had <laughs> schemed in my mind that I could. And then as soon as he said that, I was like, oh, fuck. All right, now I, fucking, work. I, I gotta get to work. I've got like, I could send it semi soon. Otherwise he might suspect that I haven't really done this yet. <laughs> so uh, I went to work and was up all night for like, a month and a half i rewrote i rewrote about half of it added new characters took some out and uh yeah when i sent him the the uh, and i knew jonathan jans at the time who we all love and know was working on a werewolf story too and i'm like ah oh, i've got to get mine in before his his comes out or else they'll say no we've already got a werewolf story and yep. it's one of our buddies so i i like double timed it got the book done sent it in and i'm just like uh waiting, waiting, waiting. And then he sent me like a message and said, I I love it. It's perfect. Let's let's do it. And I'm like, Oh, my God. oh no. how did I pull that? <laughs> I, 
to remember you work in that book for a long time. And, and it takes that. I mean, if you want to be really, you know, realistically published by a publisher who actually has legs and money to promote and mm -hmm. actually stuff in bookstores, you know, it doesn't happen overnight for most people. Um, it can happen overnight if you just upload your manuscript to Amazon and self-publish it. And there are reasons to do that sometimes. But, you know, if your goal is to actually be in bookstores, that's not probably going to get you there. And that was right. always the goal. I mean, I grew up, you know... My favorite thing when I was a kid was I'd go periodically to weekends at my grandma's house and my, my treat there, because they really had nothing to do at their house. It was um, hard they would take me, No, they would take me out to the mall to Walden Books. Nice. And let me a mall? Pick, Did you say a mall? What's that? A mall, you know, a real mall where there were little chain stores, little chain bookstores, a major net, um, you know, crown... <laughs> and Crocs and Brentanos and Walden books and God, all the others. We had, um, we had Mr. Paperback up here. But, you know, the biggest thing was like, I got to go and pick out, I don't remember, three books, five books off the shelf and take them home. And that's what I'd spend the weekend doing at their house because there was nothing else to do. I'd just lay there on the floor and read all these books. And so I've got a ton of old mass market paperbacks from that. But that that gave me the love of I want to once I started writing, it was like I want to be one of those books on the shelf. So for me, just being self-published and on Amazon was not, not what I wanted. That that didn't fulfill anything for me. Right. And that like what was this 2007, 2008? I mean, it was just starting too the ebook. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it led to the demise, we know now, to the demise of uh, leisure because they weren't ready for it. They weren't no. prepared for it at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, I run into that now. It still feels, I have self-published books. I know you have too. Yep. Um, but it's like we've been, we've been, it feels like we've been vetted a little bit because we've been through tried it the traditional way and, and got someone to accept it. And to me, that feels like it makes it feel a little bit better. I'm, and I'm not trying to badmouth anyone that only self-publishes. I, I believe in self-publishing. I I think I learned a lot because I self-published uh, my second no, uh, novel was a book called The Haunted Halls. And I had no right to be putting that book out at the time. I mean, I didn't have an editor. <laughs> I didn't have any of that. I sent it to James Ward Kirk. Um, who was taking people's stories and putting them out. He, I don't know if he still does it or not. I mean, he, he builds confidence for writers, but he doesn't pay them, um, or he didn't at the time. Maybe he does now. But he put the book out for me after I finished it, and I'm, I think he did a slight edit to it. You know, it wasn't any major major deal. But it, it didn't feel real still doing it that way to me because I I needed to have – I needed to feel like I was signed to somebody, you know, officially. Yeah. And and I me mean, making it with Dawn was like the goal for me because I, I really started reading when I started getting into that leisure books, uh, the horror club. That's when my love really ramped up again. I mean, when I was a kid, it was there. Disappeared over my hair metal and punk rock days where I was just <laughs> reading magazines and that was it. Um, then a couple of Stephen King books and then the leisure books and that got me into it. And, uh, I just think it's, it's, it, I don't know. It's, 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 it's like you, you, you are, you pay your dues, right? I mean, it takes oh, yeah. time to make something great happen and it feels good when it does. And then if you take it serious after that, if you want to put out some books on your own, I feel like that's, that's a different story. That's a better way to do it. I wish everyone would try it that way at least. But Amazon does make it very easy for people to just be like, I've got an idea. I've got the story. It's from start to finish. Here it is. Yep. Yep. No, I, I, I you know, I'm old school in the sense that I, I do believe you should pay your dues. I think you, you spend a long time, you know, writing a lot of stuff, getting a lot of rejections, which should be teaching you stuff to do better next time. So that mm -hmm. by the time you actually get to the point where you can reach a broader audience, you're ready for it and you've honed right. some skills. And yeah, maybe you don't need as much editing as you used to. Although, you know, everybody needs editing. Um, Absolutely. Nobody is their best own editor. Um, I'd be the first to admit that. Um, 
and honestly, you know, while it, I'm 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 for self-publishing for certain things. I, I think you shoot yourself in the foot and you, if, if you have any talent at all, I think you owe it to yourself to try to get that book sold to the best bidder to reach the biggest possible audience. Right. And doing it yourself is probably not that. Um, you know, I the only book that I've actually self-published from the start was the sequel to Covenant and Sacrifice. And the only reason I did it was because Leisure was gone. And mm -hmm. so the publisher of the original two books was gone. The publisher that owned the licenses for those books is now 47 North, which is right. an Amazon. That's the Amazon. Yep. But they had no interest in continuing the series. And I had a third book I wanted to write. So now I have a third book that I can't give to anybody because the people who own the rights to the first two don't want it. Right. And yeah, I could have given it to a small press. Just another small press would have done it. But at that point, I was like, well, they can sell 500 copies or I can sell 500 copies and keep all the money because, frankly, that's what we're talking about there. So that's yep. the one book that I did myself. But everything else has been published by somebody else and edited by somebody else and had cover art by somebody else before I ended up republishing it when publishers went out of business, basically. Right. Right. That's happened with my Delirium stuff. That's happened with my Twilight Tale stuff, and obviously the Sam Hain books. But the Leisure stuff is all still not with Forty Seven North, and then obviously my new stuff is with Flame Tree. So, oh, Flame Tree, yeah. And so far, you've got three books with Flame Tree. I'm sure you're probably working on a fourth one. Fourth one is halfway done. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was just talking because I talked to Hunter like a month ago, and it was the same thing. Like, uh, Misfits was just coming out or just getting ready to come out, and he's already got the next one done or whatever. I mean, he he writes like a madman, anyways. I think he writes faster than almost anyone I know. So, or does write faster than anyone I know. But um, yeah, I so I just I read uh, what was it? House of the Cemetery? House was it? House uh, near the uh, cemetery? Behind the cemetery? At the I cemetery? Think full time. By the cemetery. I was getting there. That was next. <laughs> I was under the cemetery. <laughs> under the cemetery. <laughs> Around. So I've got, I don't have House at the Cemetery, uh, by the cemetery right now, but I've got, I haven't read this one yet, but I just got this. I grabbed a copy off the Flame Tree sale. Sweet. Because I haven't read this one yet. So I'm looking forward to that one, but I, I dug into this one first. You have an actual physical copy. I yeah, don't this is, one yet. but you see, it's got the, uh, because I do a lot of reviewing and I, I post a lot, I, I'm i not ashamed to ask our publisher for uh, uh, arcs, uh, printed arcs, they, because. They usually, they usually send the authors arcs. I have not gotten one yet. I probably need to bug them and make sure I get one. I always collect arcs. I have, because they always have that little symbol or whatever, so they're different than the final thing, and I. Uh -oh. Uh oh, you froze you good. Yeah, I froze up a little bit there. You're um, in the matrix. I didn't notice anything. I mean, uh, I'm reading Hunters right now for Misfits, and I've seen a couple of little editorial blips, like extra periods and stuff, just simple stuff. I didn't notice anything going through this, but I got right into it. So, and you said this one is in it's in first person, right? The only novel I've done in first person, so it was kind of risky. I didn't know if I could pull that off. Yeah, so maybe that, that's what really gives it, like I said, like when I think I was messaging you about it being like uh, one of the hard crime books or whatever that are out. Like at the beginning, it kind of felt like that to me, especially. Um, and that might have been, that's probably a major part of it was that first person. You usually get like that detective, this is my life, this is what's going on, and it gets into the the, the, the mystery and stuff. Um, how do you say his name? Is it Rabo? Rabo, yeah. Rabo, okay. Yeah, Detective Rabo, yeah. I, it's just classic. And like I said, he seemed kind of like that hard crime type detective at the beginning. But as the story progresses, it totally turns into like my regular, what I expect from a John Everson book. <laughs> and I like that. I like that I got two things. I like that it was kind of like, oh, this is a little different for him. And now I know it was the first person probably mostly. But I'm like, I was totally in. I'm like, I love it. I, I, cool. Something's different about this one, but I love it. And then 
I then I get a little ways in and I'm like, all right, some of this stuff, this uh, this really freaky stuff's going to start happening and the, the sex stuff and the weird stuff. Something's going to happen somewhere in here. And then once that stuff kicks in, it's just total like you all the way. Um, <laughs> the rituals, the rituals were like, I'm just, I was reading it at work because it's slow. We just opened back up. It's a hotel. So I'm out back and I get to these scenes. Uh, and the, the uh, <laughs> my wife's looking at me now. So listen, she's heard me talk about Richard Lehman books. So she used, she used to ask me, tell me about the book you're reading. And then I told her about the cellar and, uh, you know, the penis with the teeth on it. And she was like, ah, you don't need to tell me about any more of these books. So <laughs> the cellar was my first Lehman that I read. And, it, and it's probably my favorite. I haven't read enough of his, but I, I love that. I love the whole Beast House series. My favorite of the Beast House series is actually the Midnight Tour, which was, it, again, it was the first one I read by him. I picked it up at Walmart or something, I think, when it came out. <clears throat> and it was a leisure book. Um, and I just loved it. it. It's a little bigger. And I went back and I read the other ones, too. And I still, I love the first one and, and that one. That one's, I think, the third one in the series. Did you read that one, the Midnight Tour? I have not read that one. I didn't realize that was connected to to the cellar yeah the uh one of the relatives i can't remember it's a, it's a, i don't remember how it is because it's been a while since i read it but one of the relatives has owns the beast house and has opened it up for a tourist attraction and then this um this guy brings his girlfriend up and his girlfriend doesn't want doesn't want anything to do with this murder house that they're going to so that's that's interesting right there. And he still has to get in there and all kinds of chaos ensues. And there's still one of these beasts hanging around the house, obviously. But it's awesome. It's awesome. It, it was my introduction. And I went back about the first couple. But I remember reading, I was just talking to somebody about Layman online and, and Rump, the Rump came up. So the master of the Rump. And uh, that's a seller I really remember. It really stood out a lot in that book. That he used that word a lot. It's like, all right, well, whatever, it's his thing. I think everybody, but, uh, like, whenever you really connect to an author, you know, you read that first book and you're like, oh my God, this is great. Like, mm -hmm. that ends up sticking with you an awful lot of times is that's my favorite book by that person. I know that that's worked that way for me um, because it's the most, you know, it's the first introduction to somebody's head. Um, and after mm -hmm. that, they could still do lots of great stuff, but you've already had the introduction. So it, it's yeah. like almost never going to be as fresh and new because everybody <clears throat> has voice and you do sort of repeat themes and ideas and stuff mm -hmm. throughout your work, I think. So, I mean, that, that works perfectly like how I am with you. Like the 13th is still like in my mind, that's still my favorite. I like that siren. I like them all, but the, the uh, 13th siren and probably the family tree and then the new one those are probably my four favorites off the top of my head still going back and uh the family tree i just love that book it just it was and that's the thing too right it's like you just said like you you've been introduced to the your brain the author's brain you just you understand like okay when is this going to happen something's going to happen but and you'll revisit those things but it's like as a reader if you fall in love with that, that whatever that thing is, like I said, even with the, with the new book, I'm waiting for it. And when it happens, I'm like, yes, I knew it. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, that, that's true. I mean, I'm like that with Edward Lee, like his stuff I adore. And, you know, I his, his books are just about the only books, I think, in the last 20 years that I've read a, a book start to finish one day because I couldn't put it down. There are a couple others that I have done that with, but him consistently, I've done that. And I don't yeah. have eight or 10 hours to lay around the house on a weekend and read a book, but I've done that several times with his, especially the early stuff, you know, the Incubi, Succubi, Coven, Creakers, uh, the City Infernal books, um, just love all that stuff. Yeah, he's one of those things where he's actually one of the few that I guess I can not pick a favorite. I don't remember. Well, no, I do remember. And it's <laughs> not my his. The first book that I read of his was uh, 
um, the gross out book, uh, the big head. Mm -hmm. And I read it because I was a proofreader for Necro Publications at the time. And Dave sent that to me to proof. And I got to say, I don't know that I would have finished it had I not been proofing it. It was like, it was just so foul, so much grossness for grossness sake. Um, yeah. But I did go on and I read Morley and I actually liked his other stuff that was a little more, you know, reasonably plotted than just gross out. Um, right. Not that he doesn't have that. He has gross out stuff and everything, but that was just his, that was his mission to be over the top on that book. We I think I've it. only read a handful of his books, and no, I haven't read any of the ones you just mentioned. I've seen them. I know of them. Um, I read the one that sticks to me that's probably one of my top ten favorite books. is uh, It was The Gast House, but it's uh, The Black Train. Oh, my God. When I read that, some of those scenes, I was just like, what the fuck am I reading? How is somebody writing this? It was like a similar, I got that feeling with that book and with uh, Rath James White's The Resurrectionist. Yeah, like, it broke, my, it broke my brain. But, and with Rath's book, I, I tore his book up when I finished it. When I read <laughs> the ending, when I read the ending of that book, it was the only book I've ever said, no, no one's reading this. I'm not even getting rid of it. I'm going to destroy it and throw it in the garbage. And I told him this story. I told him this story. Uh, it's just, I was so mad about Dale at the end. I'm like, no. And I threw it away. And it wasn't until a couple of years later, I was telling, retelling the story to Shane McKenzie. And he's like, you have to tell Rath this. You have to tell him, he has to hear this story. And while I was telling it, I got all wound up all over again. I hadn't thought about that book in two years, but he had a copy of it on the table. And I started talking about it. I got so passionate about it. I was like, I have to read this book again. I have to. And I, I reread it during this with this leisure time thing I was doing. And I, I loved it. I was like, I mean, I still got so mad again, all over again at the end. But it's uh, yeah, these authors that those two guys in particular, man, they can they can do that. They can mess with you. It's like I've read tons of horror stuff, but nothing like that. That like it's 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 not like like you said, with like the big head one sounds like it's ridiculous. You know what I mean? That sounds ridiculous. Some of the bizarro horror sounds ridiculous. I don't, I haven't checked that stuff out because it doesn't, doesn't appeal to me. But like, this seemed almost real enough. Yeah. You know? And then it had this extra like level. And I was like, oh my God, how do they do that? How can you sit down? And I've, I asked, I've asked him, I've asked, uh, I didn't ask Ed about it, but I've asked, I interviewed uh, Rath about it. And he was just like, just what the characters would do. <laughs> Tim sure. Tim Wagner said the same thing to me about some of his crazy scenes that he's written. When I asked him, he's just like totally like straight face. That's that's the character. That's just those are the things they would do. So I just wrote them. Well, you've read Siren. You know yeah. the the way that ends. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember something about a fish. My wife has not read a lot of my stuff. She's not a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> and she got to the she was actually reading that book and she was liking it and she's telling me oh yeah i'm really enjoying this i'm surprised that she was really enjoying this i think and she got to the end while i was at work one day i got <laughs> angry she's like how could you do that you're an asshole <laughs> she was so angry with me about the ending of that book and i and that's what my answer was is like that's what he would do i mean i'm not going to give away the ending but that's what he would do and actually a lot of i mean there there are two classes of readers who go into that book too when you look at when you look at the reviews there are so many people who hate the ending mm -hmm. because they wanted you know happy ending yeah they wanted disney you know everybody's happily ever after and you know yeah, i don't do that either I don't believe horror should always be happily ever after. It should be sometimes, but right. Yeah, I'm all for that. Letting it letting it unfold the way you think, the, how it should. You you can change the ending. I've changed the ending of Blood and Rain. Uh, the one the version that's in print now. Uh, I changed the ending, and I'm I'm still not like super pumped. 
it just there's just one thing. There's one thing about the ending. There was the kill at the end, and who did it and who didn't do it. Originally, it was switched around a little bit, but I'm I'm not as happy with it. I don't remember why I switched it either. I think a buddy of mine had pre-read it, beta read it for me, and said, "Oh, this person did all this work and deserves the deserves the kill at the end." And I was like. You know, like you said, I've been shopping that book for a couple of years. I'm like, well, maybe that's it. Maybe I switched that one thing. And there we go. And I did it. And I'm not super pumped with it. I mean, overall, I still love it. Just that one little bit that made it through bugs me. Well, someday you have to do the author's unedited, expurgated, whatever version. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's funny, too. Like uh, thinking about like the self-publishing i remember when i finished that book it was the first i'd written a couple of short stories not tried to sell them anywhere they were just in they were in one of these notebooks just like for myself for fun i think i bought stephen king's on writing and he had a couple of assignments or something in there try this and i tried and i liked what i came up with i was like well that's pretty good so then i would just when i was home alone my girlfriend was at work i'd be like all right well i'm just gonna play around in my mind on this paper. And I liked what I was writing, but I didn't think it was anything. When I wrote Blood and Rain, it was years later. It was probably close to a decade after that. I, Cause I played in bands all that time. And when my band stuff kind of stopped, cause I started having a family and it's a lot harder. Um, I decided, well, well, what else do I really love? And I loved writing. And I picked up one of these, one of the short stories I had written was the a werewolf short story. And it was pretty much the first chapter of Blood and Rain. And I just kind of typed it up, fixed it, started editing it, shared it with somebody. They shared it with the, and they they said, well, what happens next? And that's how I started writing that book was like these buddies of mine that we used to talk horror books together. I showed them that one thing there. They wanted to know what happened next. And they kept saying that every time I sent them another chapter, they were like, come on, where's the next one? I'm ready. I'm ready. Right. And uh, it was exciting. And I finished and I. I almost wonder, because it was right before all the self-publishing stuff really got going and was really made easy. Not not much before it, but just enough, I think, where <clears throat> Don had just gone to Sam Hain, started the, the Sam Hain line, horror line, and I was like, oh my God, this is perfect. This is perfect, because I was like, oh, I was reading all those leisure books. I knew who Don was. I'm like, I like this story. I should get it to him. And I'm like, the rational part of my brain that probably some people are missing that see the easy way to this. I was like, you, you can't give Don Doria this book. You will never get a chance to show him another book again. If you give him this, this is not ready. You don't know what you're doing yet. You just, you wrote a good story, but it needs a lot of work. And by, I, I was lucky enough to have, I, and I don't usually have self-control. So this was pretty special. <laughs> like I, I held on to it and I just kept working on it, working on it, working on it. Then I started submitting stories and all that stuff. But uh, I just wonder if, if, if it was, as, if I would have now, if I'd have been trying to start writing now, if I would have just tried to self publish it myself, I wouldn't be surprised, but I'm glad, I'm glad I didn't. And I'm glad I had the, you know, the wherewithal or whatever, to just not do that. I, I knew that I'd have one shot when I sent to Don. Yeah, if I actually sent it to somebody that was a professional. I did one shot. I didn't want to fuck it up by sending something that wasn't quite ready yet. No, and it's you know it's all what your goals are. Um, you know, if your goal is simply to get a book done and put it out there and and move on with your life, then you know self publishing is good. If your goal is to have full career in in publishing, that might where each book might lead to a bigger and bigger thing, you're probably better served to you know, be trying to go with publishers and, and move up the ladder in that way. It's, it's what you want to do. Uh, you know, there are lots of people who just want to publish their autobiography. And, you know, let's, let's face it. There aren't many publishers that are going to take everybody's autobiography. So you're probably only real way to do that is to self publish it. And that's not to say that it shouldn't be, published, but it is going to have a much smaller audience than anything a publisher is ever going to want to touch. Right. And the thing that I just heard about Flame Tree, too, is the Simon & Schuster, like, distribution deal. I'm, I'm curious how that's going to play. And is that thicker? 
<laughs> Tell me how my book is. Now, is that thicker than uh, Devil's Equinox? Yes, it is. Interesting. Let me look. Hold on. I remember this with Sam Hain. Remember in Sam Hain when all of a sudden the uh, the print shrunk? Do you remember yeah. that? This is going oh, the other yeah. way, though, probably. Okay. Sorry. It's like right there. Are those books? That's those are CDs. <laughs> <laughs> what did you just say? Those are all CDs. <laughs> oh. wall, a whole wall of them. Impressive. Stay right there on the corner and have this one eye looking in. <laughs> nice and creepy, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I was impressed by your background. <clears throat> the girls want to say goodnight. Out of this there. Hi, babe. Love you. <laughs> Night. Night, dear. Night. Night, sir. Good night, sir. <laughs> Dude, look at the difference. Can you see the difference from there? Yeah. That's well, that's what I thought. I mean, just when you were holding it, I was like, that looks thicker. I don't know. And the, the print looks the same to me, or pretty close. Maybe the spacing. Yeah. But that's it's an art. Oh, that that might be the thing too. This is this was like I bought it off the sale. Yeah. They had gone on there during the uh July, fourth of July sale they had. And this is an arc. Maybe it's bigger because it's got it's got the Q and A in it. I don't think the Q and A's are in these things, right? No, because remember they get the question thing, the questionnaire thing. They have us fill out, so some of that makes it in here. Yeah, which I still haven't done it for the next book, so I, I guess I need to get that done. Soon. That's funny. It's funny, man. Yeah, that's what Hunter said when I was talking to him, and I was like, I haven't either. I've got one for the, the book I'm working on right now. I don't like to I fill, fill it out book. after I talk to Hunter. I'm oh, like, Don like might that. see this. I better finish this. Well, you know, part of, um, for anyone who doesn't know, I mean, they send you this questionnaire to sort of tell the publicist about your book so that they can promote it. And, you know, if you're only a quarter or a third of the way into writing it, I don't really want to commit right. it very much the book because things might change. So not that you should be giving away the plot on that, but I just, I don't know. I like the book to be finished before I'm actually telling anybody anything about it, frankly. Absolutely. I agree. hundred percent. Um, so, and you sell your books now to Dawn on, uh, uh, I'm guessing, sample chapters in like an outline or just an outline? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've worked with Dawn that way since Leisure because, you know, the first two books obviously were done, done. before mm -hmm. um, the 13th. Um, I wrote, so, I mean, I sold two books to him. And didn't immediately sell the third one, which I hadn't written. But, you know, I had over a year before the second one was going to be out. Actually, it was probably right. a year. And a half. So I screwed around and didn't write for a while. And then finally, I was like, you know, eventually that sacrifice book is going to be out. And I better have something to follow it up with. So I started writing a book. But at that point, I didn't tell him what I was doing. I just, like, dove in and started writing book number three. Mm hmm through it when we were at world horror in was it and i met with him and told him hey i'm working on this you know how do i how do i sell this to you and he's like well <laughs> you know you, you might since you're at this point i forget like if he told me to just wait until i was done since i was pretty close to over anyway or if he had me send him an outline at that point but basically starting with siren everything since then i've i've sent him the outline and I don't usually do sample chapters, but um, yeah, they've all been outlined since then. I remember hearing that uh, when Flame Tree started up. At that time, I would I was working on like two. I had self-published one of my books between um, Sam Hain and Flame Tree, and kind of think I'm. I know I was watching and waiting for Don to land somewhere. I knew he would eventually, but. I was trying to still stay busy and, you know, I was still just trying to make a name for myself. So I was still trying to keep my name out there with some new stuff. Um, I think Sinister Grin put out a novella for me <clears throat> and um, I submitted one book to Don when Flame Tree started and he read it and he didn't think it felt like my normal stuff. So obviously I was like, oh shit, oh fuck, what happened here? 
uh, it was a little, that's, it's a book. It's funny too. You know why? Cause it's a book I described to people as, um, oh Jesus, how did I, uh, I was like, it's, it's kind of like a coming of age story mixed with a John Everson book. <laughs> that doesn't seem like it fits, right? Kids. And then this, you know, what you can do, but it's crazy. It's crazy as it sounds. I think it worked out. But Don, Don said, I don't know. I'm not feeling this. And I went back after that and redid that book. I rewrote a bunch of stuff and kind of, you know, softened some of the edges. Um, it's about demons. So demons will fuck with people. So it's got adults in it and it's got kids in it. And the kids try to save the adults is what happens. It ended up, I think it ended up better for Don passing on it. And I'm glad he passed on it because I was like, well, what am I going to do now? And I, I knew you sold on outlines. I knew Tim Wagner sold on outlines. I'm like, I mean, I've worked with him enough. Maybe he trusts me if I send him an outline for a book. And I had a book I'd wanted to write for a long time. I just had had time to start it. And uh, Tim helped me out and gave me some tips. And I sent him an outline for my book that just came out in May, which was a vampire eighties book uh, until summer comes around. Yeah. And uh, that was the first time. And I was like, I asked him, I said, would you, would you look at an outline? And he said, yeah, send me an outline. Send me some, a couple first couple chapters and I'll take a look at it. And he bought it. And I was like, nice. What? Well, I mean, that's so then, once you prove yourself, you've done two, three or four books and like they were consistent and the editor likes them. You can do that. I mean, you, but you've proven yourself. You've done it multiple times, not just once. Right. Um, you know, it's a lot easier then. People can trust you because and the book business is working so far ahead in some areas. You know, the thing I write now is not going to come out for 18 months. Um, right. And, you know, so you, you don't want to and, and it's going to take six months to write it. So you don't want to commit all this time and have it be lost time. Um, so. You know, and the, and the publisher could still pass on it. I mean, they could like your outline and say, yeah, we'll buy it. And then you turn it in. They're like, man, I don't know what the hell happened to you, but here's your advance back. <laughs> they can do that. So, well, you know, it's yeah, man. like, uh, you know, it's a hundred percent sure thing, but hopefully. Right. It is. Right. You know, and then, well, like you said, it's part of like that whole paying your dues. You've worked with you've worked with this person or a couple of people, a couple of different editors a certain amount of times. They feel comfortable. They know that you can deliver. And like, I think with, with Blood and Rain, Don had me rewrite one part. I think the uh, prologue or whatever, the the beginning of the book, he just said, this this is written like, I remember he said it was like a purple, purple writing or whatever that term purple. is. Purple prose or something. And I was like, oh yeah, okay. And he's like, just rewrite it so that it sounds like what you write. And I was like, <laughs> okay i went in and did it and he's like perfect i was like okay all right but like so coming off from the window which was the book that was that he passed on and then he took that that um outline i was like oh my god what if yeah what if he's what if i deliver something and he's like no this is too much like that last thing you sent me i was petrified but he took it and he loved it and it's been good and i sold the next the new book that i'm working on now is an outline that i sold to him too um, so I'm working on that and yeah, the questionnaire business. I just, I just finished that after I talked to Hunter and he's like, Oh, I still got to do that for the, for the next thing I've got for him. And I was like, Oh shit, I still haven't done mine either. I got to get that done. And like you were saying, it's so hard. Like so much can change in that story. Like I, I remember I was always afraid of outlining because I was like, it's going to kill my creativity. I always write like by the seat of my pants. I am just like the reader. I don't know what's going to happen next, you know? So yeah. I thought that added that that was guaranteed excitement. Like we, none of us know what's going to happen next. How is the reader going to predict it if I don't know? But it worked out really well. I was surprised doing the outline that the story, the characters come to life and they, they, they create these scenes that you don't have in the outline that you don't expect and add, add to the whole story. And it's great. Well, and it depends how detailed your outline is. Um, you know, I think the the book that I'm working on now, 
I, it was maybe a three page outline. I mean, it was really short, um, which right now in the middle of the book, I'm like, damn, I wish I would fleshed this out a little bit. Cause now I'm really like, I'm back to seat in my pants. You know, it's like, uh, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, how did we get from here to there? Oh yeah, that's the fun part. And it is the fun part, honestly. I mean, you do you come up with stuff that you had no idea was gonna happen back when you started the book, and then that energizes you because you're telling yourself a story. If I know every single plot detail, like down to the minute and some authors are right. like that, like they'll do a hundred page outline for a three hundred page book. I'm, and then they what? draw up. I've seen people that have these character sheets where they create the whole character and they're like every aspect of the character from what they look like to what their traits are, what they dislike, don't like, turn on, turn offs. I've seen some, I know some writers that have these sheets. I actually got one from one. He sent me one and I looked at it and I'm like, and I thought, oh, this would be cool. And I tried to sit down and fill one out and I'm like, I can't do this. This is crushing me. Like it's ruining everything for me. I don't want. I don't want to get into this. I don't need to do that. But some people work like that, like you oh, were just yeah. saying. Well, and it sort of depends on how, like how you do it. Um, so, can I share my screen on this? Does it let you do that? Probably not. I don't know. <laughs> if you turn your computer, no, you're showing. you you're looking into your yeah. camera right now. No, it will let me share my screen. If you know how to do it, I don't have any technology on this end, but if you could... <gasps> Look, you did it. Something? Did you see anything? I see some ladies. I still, yeah, I still see myself in the camera view, so I don't know if you're seeing this. But... No, I see yeah, some so... ladies. I see your cursor moving around. So, yeah, I see uh, a box of, I, I think I see a box of tissues. <laughs> <laughs> Right. No, I don't. Let's see some ladies. Yep. So I have a character sheet going for the current book. Mm-hmm. Because, and the reason is, is I will forget eye color, hair color, what floor their room is on. Um, you know, all those kind <laughs> of little details that you make up as you go along. And, you know, 20 chapters down the line. I don't remember what the hell hair color she was. Because I just... <laughs> Because that's not the way my mind works. Like some people are like, but you created a character. How could she not be vivid in your mind? Like every aspect. It's like, Meh. Uh, no, I don't I've remember seen your what... pictures online. You're in the pub late at night with some of these. It's not it even that. the senses I, just enough. I have, I have come home literally and said to my wife, is the house across the street always been blue? I mean, seriously. Dude. I am terrible with memory of of things. So if I made it up at 10 o'clock at night, yeah, I'm not going to remember that three days from now. No, I'm so the same I, way. I, like, I, people will... I bat this outline. Like, is I, if I'm far enough into a book at, at a certain point, I will sit down and I'll like go through everything that I've written and do like little one paragraph summaries of each chapter Me so too. that I remember how I and I reference it and make sure that I've tied up all the loose ends. And that sometimes mm-hmm. I'll do a character sheet like this where I'll actually I'll look on the internet and just grab pictures of people who look kind of like what I was thinking the character looks like. And I'll plug them into a sheet so that I can basically when I'm proofing, I can then be looking at the character sheet and going through the chapters and going, OK, you didn't change your hair color from blue to purple to blue right. again, stuff like that. But I don't no, I'm, do it ahead. I'm the same way I don't with make- like sheet which you know before i write the book i've got three pages written about every character no and i know some people do that i don't, I don't do that no but i mean it's it's really exciting as a writer to like go into it not knowing all that stuff and kind of discovering it it makes it it's part of the discovery it's the same thing as what makes you as a reader want to read the book you want to discover all this stuff and it's really cool. I mean, the sum, it's, I like the some writers at that detailed ahead of time, but and maybe they make millions of dollars, I don't know, and have movies. But like for me, I got into this because of that excitement of discovering all the stuff as a reader. So when I write a book, I've always in my mind, I always want to write a book that I want to read. You know what I mean? So discovering all this stuff along the way is part of the adventure for, for us, too. Oh, absolutely. 
Now, three page outline, that would be something. I, I that would be that's still like a lot of work. <laughs> like you were just saying, like that's not a lot to go on. No, well, and it wasn't it wasn't intended to be that, honestly. Um originally I had a brainstorming session. Where was I? <laughs> In a bar. Was there a hamburger in the scene? <laughs> there was no hamburger, but there was a beer. No, I sat down and I, I wrote up, I don't know, three or four like really quick treatments of, mm -hmm. well, I could work on a book like this, or I could work on this book, or I could work on this book. And to be honest, what I really wanted to do was a giallo. And because I don't know if you know those, if you watch Italian horror and crime movies, but... I love giallos. So Argento, Fulci, Bava, they're the kind of inventors of the genre. Um, but there are hundreds of giallos from the 70s and 80s, and I love them all. There are, a lot of the, the thesis of that is, you know, the black glove killer who's wearing a mask, and we are wondering the whole movie who this guy is and what he has, you know, why he's killing these people. And, you know, often you have an American tourist or an American student in Europe, who's, I've you know, seen the, I've seen the big one. What's the uh, one with Jennifer Connelly in it? Uh, and Don, oh, that's, Don, uh, you mean Phenomena? Yeah, 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 yeah. And Loomis is in there, too. You mean Phenomena? I don't know if you can yeah, see it. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I see it right now. <laughs> Yeah, that one I, I've seen, and I love that movie. I just haven't seen, I haven't ventured into the rest of the world yet. This is probably way too dark, but yeah, I've got the uh, the whole horror shelf over there. But anyway, I love those films. I watched you get those. The TV, you get the movie set up down there in a chair. Go back now. What is that chair you get over there? You get a chair or a couch or something all set up. What, this? What is this? Your own personal movie theater here. Oh, Absolutely. I'm there every Friday and Saturday night watching movies got, 70s. <laughs> I've got three children in my house. I don't have a chance to have something like that until maybe 10 years from now. Well, this is house number three. House numbers one and two didn't look like that. <laughs> that gives me hope. This is, uh, I always, t Don, uh, Don knows this and he references it. This is the, the basement that Horror built. So. It's beautiful. The TV was uh, was book revenue. A lot of the movies are book revenue. The bar that I'm sitting at, um, I actually built uh, back when I the flooded, um, and I had to tear up all the carpet. I replaced oh, no. the old, there was an old crappy little bar here, and so I re I built this one, but I paid for all the wood out of book royalties. And now, uh, I have a, a side room over here, which is the game room, which I can give you a tour of. That's really the the uh, the basement that books built because every couple of years I'll end up buying a pinball machine or something. Now, does your son come down and go over there while you're working on stuff? How well, old is he now? He's 15, and that's his uh, that's his uh, uh, marimba, which is covered, but. Yeah, so he plays he plays marimba and piano and, in jazz band and uh, drum kit. So I'll actually nice and quiet. Oh wow! Yeah, so is that his air hockey. Over. What is that music? You'll see in a second. Yes. So we've picking? got a nice little, we've got a nice little studio going over here in the corner. I'm getting nervous. My old, my old keyboards, which never get played anymore. His drums, and then over here. Those are beautiful. I used to love pinball. Yep. So yeah, this is uh, this is where I spend an awful lot of time. It's a great place not to write. <laughs> and then you know back here then we have the official scoreboard for all the pins nice which if you'll notice an awful lot of 20s at the very top the last six months have been really great for
for setting high scores on all my games because I've been home all the time. <laughs> what the hell was that? That's sorcerer. You got too close to it. You hey, don't get sucked into that machine while we're talking right now. <laughs> it's on attract mode. You never know. I was getting nervous when you brought me back to that room. I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought the uh, who's the black the black voodoo the dark voodoo woman. Oh jeez, voodoo woman. The bad the bad voodoo bad juju lady. Oh, the queen. Oh, we don't want to know. Just we'll just call her the black queen because we don't want to give away anything. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god. Oh my God! The Black Queen. When he first goes out there looking, and he goes to, uh, oh, it's near the port or something, some place where he's a pier or something. That woman that lives out near there, and he gets stuck in the basement. <laughs> and has to make a deal. Oh my God, dude! I was like, this is what I came for, but I don't know if I can handle this. It was awesome. That, it was perfect. It was that, perfect. I was like, do I really want to go there in this book? Do I really want to go oh, I'm there? I'm so glad you went there. As a fan, I'm so glad you went there. Oh, my God. It was necessary, I think. I thought it was necessary. And you don't know. Look, I got, I got, a, I'm at my, I'm at this table. You probably, well, let me see. I got this little, it looks like almost like a bar table, right? Yeah. I got my peanuts. I got my little uh, thing of peanuts here, and my so I, I could feel like I was at a bar when I talked to you. So I've got my IPA, I've got my peanuts on my table, yeah, I got see? a notebook nope. in case I got any ideas. But then I brought this guy's books over here, and I didn't know what, was it, what I was going to do with them. But. So do you Man, hand, I, do you handwrite ideas? Do you handwrite ideas? I only do that for. I only started doing that with outlines. I mean, originally when I started. I think I tried my first short story in like 2001 or something. And I did those all in notebooks because no one was going to look at them except me. Cause I, I knew I was like, I wrote songs at the time, but I didn't want anyone looking at these. I've written a ton. I've written thousands of bad songs. All right. I always write the lyrics first. So I kind of like told these stories forever. I only share with people what I think is good. Like, People are like, oh, your, your songs, I love these songs. I'm like, well, if you'd seen like the 50 songs I wrote before I got this one, you would not be saying these nice things to me. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. But when I started outlining, because I, I did a little research, I got a book about outlining, and they were talking about brainstorming. I was like, holy shit, brainstorming, of course that would, that makes sense. Of course that's how you would start an outline. Get it going with your idea and then brainstorm. I'll do that in the notebooks. And then... It's funny. It's funny. Like the first one that I wrote, Tim, I wrote to Tim Wagner and he sent me like a sample of one of his, which was like 14 pages. So when you said three pages, I was like, what? But yeah, this 14 your, page outline had a lot of different. <laughs> no, no, and I, I totally trust that you'll come up with something awesome out of those three pages. But I was like, okay, 14 <laughs> pages seems like I have a lot to work with. I like this. So I, I kind of aim for, I think, 10 pages. And I sat down and started writing. And what was so bizarre to me and made me so happy was writing the outline and, and trying to figure out what motivates this character to do, what would they do next. I kind of had that what would happen, what happens next going on while I was writing the outline. And it was almost as if, I think I wrote the outline for Until Summer Comes Around in one afternoon. It was kind of like, I kind of like I said, though, I kind of had like an idea brewing in my head over a couple of years. So when I sat down and tried to figure out, I knew the characters. I knew the, the three main characters of the story. But once I started working on it, when I got like to page six, seven or eight or whatever, I was like, oh, my God, this this I've got like the the excitement that comes with the writing by, you know, the seat of your pants. Like I'm discovering this whole story like right now. And when I finished, I looked at it and I was like, I can't fucking believe this. <laughs> I was so excited. It was almost like when you write the end on the story, like I had the story. I just had now I have to go and write it. But it gave yeah, me now, confidence to go and do it. And I said, that's it. 
Now the trick is to actually make the chapters be as exciting as that outline. Right. And the like, Which I told so Don, I'm like, mm, 70,000 words or something. I've, I've hit chapters where I'm like, I go back and I look at the outline and I look at the chapter and I'm like, you know, I felt like this was going to be better. <laughs> and sometimes you can rewrite it and save it. And sometimes it's like, no, it's things, things have changed and right. different. I mean, little different things change. And so the actual plot of the book is not necessarily exactly what the outline was. And that changes the way it feels. Right. And we talked about that, I think, one time when I was talking to you about this and you had said something similar to that was like, I was writing the book and then it kind of, you know, went a different way. So I readjust kind of like my mental outline. I don't know if you actually went down and rewrote an outline or just mentally adjusted it, but you had said some stuff had changed and you just go with the flow. Because obviously, like any writer, I think the story really commands everything that's going to happen. You, you're pulling this up and where these characters that you're creating, they dictate where it's going to go. I mean, you can have an idea and you can kind of direct it in that direction, but it, it, it might completely change us. And at any point it could completely change. It's, it's, I've never had anything completely change. It's, it's more that you've made decisions along the way, little decisions, but little decisions mm -hmm. all add up. Add up. Then you get to a point where it's like, okay, well, that original plot, voila, that I thought was going to happen doesn't make as much sense now because of all the little things that I've set up that don't quite support it. So you can either go back and redo those so that they do support it, or you can decide to go in a slightly different direction. I think the biggest thing for me is simply having plot lines that I never thought of materialize because with like Siren, that was the very first book that I wrote on an outline. And I, I realized about three or four chapters into it that if I only wrote what was in the outline, I had a novella. Exactly. That, that wasn't going to work. Um, and so then I, I hatched on the idea of, well, what if I tell the story of the siren 100 years ago and how she actually got to this coastline? And I started mm -hmm. doing parallel narrative. Um, so every other chapter is kind of now, then, now, then. And it was, A, it was really a lot of fun to write that way. Um, right. Um, but actually, I think I like the backstory better than the front story in a lot of ways. <laughs> and none of the backstory was in the outline. The outline said nothing about 100 years ago. And that's a, right. a third of the book. Well, what I like about that, too, and it worked perfect for that for that book. But I, I've read there's a book that's really popular that does does uh it's it's all what's happening now and then all of a sudden like that's like the first like four or five chapters then all of a sudden like this giant chunk of the book is the backstory and then at the very end we get back to the now story and i was as a reader very invested in the now story i liked the backstory but then it didn't end it didn't do the the back and forth it just yeah. all of a sudden it felt like i got this completely different novel or novella in the middle of this book and I was pissed. I was like, I, I don't think I've seen it before where it's been so, so big. Like I'm used to like what you just said, where it goes back and forth a little bit. Even if it's, even if it's not every other chapter, it's a few chapters and then there's one or two chapters in the past. And then it goes back to the now story. Cause you always, to me, you always want to be invested in the now story, yeah. right? That's like the main thing. You get into the character that you care about is this character that's now. It's cool to learn about the past stuff and how that affects the decision making going forward. But you really, as a reader, you're invested in the now character. That's who you've introduced. And that's who you've said, this is the guy. I was so pissed about this book. And I'm not going to say what it is because <laughs> it is pretty popular. But and I liked and don't get me wrong. I loved I loved the backstory, but I was so just irritated, like as a reader, like. By the time it got back to the now, I was like, I don't give a fuck about that guy now. Whatever. I don't even care. Why did we even go back to him? <laughs> you know, it felt like this guy should have either made it two separate books or something or, or had fixed it up so that he went back and forth all the way through so that you were still invested in the now. Spent, spent. Uh, with Siren, it worked, though. 
Thanks. You just froze. Oh, there you are. Wait, am I back? Yep. I'm voguing. Can you see me voguing? <laughs> uh, I know. We, okay, now listen. I know we both love pop divas because I know I posted this earlier because I was in the interview you tonight. <laughs> I love And her. I was going to play Gold Trans Am, but or whatever it's called. My favorite jam on this is actually, uh, where is it? Only Want to Dance With You. I love that song. That's, well, yeah. And she, I mean, with Iggy on there, that's hilarious. Is that Iggy? Yeah. I was like, why does this guy sound like David Bowie? Yeah. I love it. Because as soon as he does, like, oh, 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 well, I'm just like doing my David Bowie like while I sing it. Yeah, that made sense yeah, that it's Iggy. Kind of that, was, that was the most ridiculous pairing, and it, it's hilarious fun. Oh, dude. And, and uh, I have Welcome to My Nightmare 2, the uh, Alice Cooper album, where she does a song with him. Have you heard that one? I have not. Uh, baby, whatever baby wants, or I think it's whatever baby wants. It's on Welcome to My Nightmare. It's like this sequel, unofficial okay. sequel to Welcome to My Nightmare. It's like Welcome to My Nightmare. Okay. And Bob Hesman came back, who was the original producer of the first record, came back and worked with Alice. And Kesha does a song with him, and it's fucking awesome. I think you'd love it. I like I, I'm a huge Alice Cooper fan, so to put Alice and Kesha together, I was like, yes. This is this is amazing. And I'm, I'm just waiting now for like uh, if Bruce has like Taylor Swift come on, that would be it for me. Like you get Bruce Springsteen and Taylor Swift together and try that. Hey, it came close. She sang Summer of '69 with Brian Adams before he went nuts and said something crazy. Like they did Summer of '69, and I was like, this is the best. This is like my heaven right here, which is also a Brian Adams song. But yes, it is. That was. Pretty